Hi guys, welcome to this uh, session. This is the last session that is going to be uh, held live. So next week we will not have a live session. Uh, week six, 16 and 17 are actually clumped together. There are only six units actually in this uh, remaining two weeks. The focus is actually on the exam and whatever remaining assignments that we still have. I know we still have some quizzes, some other assignments, so please take care of them. You also have the review for the exam. Please also make sure you do the review. The, um, the last exam is gonna be on uh, December 13th. So uh, make sure you also uh, don't miss that. I know I will be sending some reminders for that. So watch out for those. And uh, so this is actually the last uh, units that we'll be covering. We're going to go briefly through some of the concepts that uh, are, uh, I know we went through the stars, we discussed the evolution of low mass stars, high mass stars, and or at least massive stars, I should say. And we saw that they end up in white dwarfs. We did not really, at least for the low mass stars, they end up in white dwarfs. We did not really have a unit on white dwarfs, but I recommend that you guys go through it too. And also, uh, we also are going to be talking actually about neutron stars and also about black holes. And then we will uh, study the galaxy itself and we will try to understand how, excuse me, as galaxies interact with one another and end the, uh, the discussion with the uh, life outside of the planet Earth. So this is basically the entire course for you guys. So it's only a few units left. Uh, since you guys have access to the book, make sure you go through the remaining of the, uh, the other units so that you can have at least a broader idea about the topics that are also interesting, but because of the time constraints, we couldn't really get through them. So uh, this is uh, in terms of general uh, announcements. As I was saying, you will have another recording, actually. I know that uh, we will do another recording, at least by this uh, Thursday. It's not going to be live, though. And uh, if you still have any questions or you still have any uh, 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 things that are not understood, please let me know. And I'll be more than happy to uh, to uh, to meet with you personally, whether on campus or online, so that we can go through these things. Uh, a word of uh, at least of interest to some of you. I know some of you are sitting in my astronomy lab classes, uh, section one, which meets today actually around 5.30 this, this afternoon. And there is section two that meets actually on Thursday, also around the same time, 5.30 p.m. And uh, next week, we're going to be going to on uh, December 7th, which is a Wednesday, we're not going to have live classes. We're not going to have, I'm sorry, in-person classes. Rather, we're going to have, uh, uh, we're going to go to the planetarium. The reason why I'm saying this here, because it's also you guys from uh, the regular class of astronomy, you're welcome also to attend with us. Uh, for you guys, it's not required. Obviously, for the other classes, they are uh, required to either attend the uh, the planetarium session or uh, uh, let me know so that they can do an alternative activity if they cannot make it because that's not normally our meeting time. So again, uh, the planetarium visit is going to be at 6 p.m. on campus in the planetarium, which is next to the Greek theater. So right in the middle of campus. So that's where we're going to be meeting. And we're going to have a session inside the planetarium. And I'm hoping Hopefully the weather will have, cooperate with us. We'll have access to the 40 um, centimeter uh, telescope there, 16 inch telescope, so that we can look at it. The reason why this is of interest to, uh, to uh, our astronomy class, at least for the lab version of it, is because we did a lot of lab activities using uh, uh, the 40 centimeter uh, telescope in Australia. We gathered a lot of data from it and we used it to measure distances and measure basically um, ages of the stars and clusters of stars and things like that. I know the telescope is far away, it's in Australia, so we never really had access to it. We gathered the data from it, that's all. But uh, uh, in our uh, planetarium, we really have a 40, in, uh, 40 centimeter telescope, so that would be a good idea to go and see uh, what we were talking about all along throughout the entire lab sessions that we had access to this uh, device. So this is basically in a nutshell in terms of general announcements. So uh, let me delve into the topics for this week. Let me share. Unit 68. 
So again, Unit 68 actually de deals with the, uh, the, uh, the, the discovery of neutron stars. Neutron stars were uh, theorized, first of all, based on uh, uh, Einstein's general theory of uh, relativity, that they exist. Obviously, uh, the black holes also were uh, 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 shown to be a solution to uh, the general theory of relativity of Mr. Einstein. But uh, among other people who really actually discredited that or did not like that at all, and they thought that they should not exist, that they are too freaky to exist, basically, too, um, to, uh, how should I put it, too kind of odd things to exist. So they are not really something that nature should do that. This is something that nature should not do because uh, uh, they are actually singularity. And so that you guys are familiar with the word singularity, in math, when you divide by zero, that is something that you can do. But if you have zero divided by zero, that is called an indetermination. You, can't, you don't know what that is, because any number would do if you want to. Because zero divided by zero, if you say one, that's possible because zero times one is zero, or if you say it's two is zero. So alternatively, you say that this is not determined, that you don't know what that is. Nobody knows what, it's not possible. This is singularity. So the same thing with the solution to a general theory of relativity, that it had it had the singularity in it, and Einstein immediately discounted it as something that is uh, uh, that should not exist. That's something that cannot exist. So therefore, uh, basically, uh, uh, they they should not exist. Now, until we started to discuss this this fast, basically uh, signals that are coming from uh, from. Uh, from far away, from the cosmos, from the from uh, distances outside of our own galaxy, and even sometimes within the galaxy itself. Initially, because they are in radio uh, radio signals, so they are uh, like radio, basically telecommunications that we use, like your cell phone, but they are equally spaced and they are within like seconds apart from each other. So initially, they were thought to be some sort of a uh, of a uh, alien communicating with us, aliens communicating with us, that maybe there are some civilization there using their radio signals, sending signals to us because the frequency is too fast, too, too high, basically, namely the fact that the signals, they have a very short period. Okay, similar to what we would do if we're trying to send a signal, trying to talk to one another using electro, electromagnetic radiation, basically radio waves. So that's how they were initially discovered. But then, they the, the model that was put for them that maybe there's some sort of neutron stars, the thing that was part of the solution of the general theory of relativity. But this neutron stars must be moving, must be spinning super fast. Okay. So actually, initially they were given the name of pulsars because of the fact that these are stars, that's where the R is coming from, that are pulsating, that are basically vibrating and their vibration is so fast that's how they were initially thought then pulsars turn out to be turned out to be neutron stars so this is the idea behind it so this is the whole thing uh these are periodic you have to understand that uh there is another thing that you might hear about uh fast radio uh, bursts, those are different. The FRBs are different. Those are bursts, basically, they come and disappear. So those are different phenomena. But the pulsars, they were discovered, and once they were discovered later on, the only model that really fits them is that of a neutron star spinning super, super fast. And we'll see why that is, okay? It has to do with the angular momentum again. So again, uh, Mr. Bell, when he was a graduate student, this guy in England discovered the uh, this periodic, basically, signals that are coming from outside. As I was saying, briefly, we thought that maybe aliens were trying to send us a signal, so maybe we were trying to get <laughs> something out of there. But then uh, these pulsating sources, which were dubbed later on pulsars, and they have very low frequency. I mean, very high frequency, I should say. Uh, meaning the period is very, very, it's of the order of seconds. Imagine the Earth. The Earth takes about 24 hours to spin on its, own, on its axis. We're spinning fast. The sun takes 25 days to spin around this axis. This thing spent less than a second, spinning super fast, less than a second. Before you blink your eye, they already spun basically in and out, okay? 
And if you were to look at it in the sky, if you go out and see a pulsating star, you would not distinguish it from a regular star because you're doing so fast, the light is coming from it so fast that you wouldn't know that it has dimmed actually and lightened in the same time. But with a device like, for example, uh, uh, big telescopes that receive signal, of course, you can find that this signal is actually repeating at a high frequency. And that is the point of it, okay? So how can you think about it? Think about the lighthouse, basically. I don't know, and I know we're, we're not too far from the ocean. So if there is a lighthouse that you can go around it, you will see if you are in the ocean, actually, that the light will come in and then go. That's exactly the phenomenon. You have a star that is spinning around its own axis. So this is the axis of rotation. So it's spinning around this way, but it's magnetic North Pole because they are actually magnetic uh, stars. This is what neutron stars are. Neutron itself is a neutral particle. And we discussed how neutron stars actually form. You guys remember a high or a more massive star, bigger than uh, 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 the, 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 not the medium stars, uh, basically toward the end of their life, they start to fuse uh, heavier and heavier elements and form iron. And then due to the, to, the, to the collapse of the core, the core itself starts to collapse until at the end, protons and electrons start to fuse, forming neutrons. So they are mainly neutrons. So for slightly less massive than, than the, 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 the more massive ones, you probably will have protons in them. But on the average, it's mainly actually neutrons. To the point that, and we're going to discuss the structure, maybe the outer structure is actually still iron. But then the inner one is for sure neutrons. And then the most inner ones, and again, we're speculating in here. Nobody went, and actually, we don't have, you cannot cut a neutron star. They are too tightly packed that it's impossible to actually see that. Is a, but the inside of them, probably there is a weird kind of uh, matter in there. More, probably it's even weirder than neutrons, namely uh, quarks. Quarks are some sort of a, a state that they are some sort of a liquid state. Quarks are these sub nuclear particles. They, they, Every, think about it, every proton is made up of three quarks inside, and every neutron is also made up of three quarks inside. There is an up quark, and an up quark, and a down quark in a regular proton, and then there is an up quark, and a down quark, and a down quark, and a regular neutron. So that's really the, what we're saying here. But because of the pressure, it's so high, and the temperature is so high inside a neutron star, this structure is broken. And actually, the quarks are floating inside. So that's what we think. Again, nobody actually flew. <laughs> this is before the onset of, 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 of black hole formation. So it's still it's massive enough to sustain itself due to the Pauli exclusion principle, namely the degeneracy. Now, the point being in here is that this is basically what's going on. So as you have a magnet that is spinning in this direction, and you have the north in here and the south in here, for example. And because the magnetic field lines, they curl around, OK? And the radiation that is emitted in this direction and in this direction is what we see. So as it spins around, that is basically what we're going to see. Because charged particles, they are lifted from the surface, the atmosphere of the, of the star, the atmosphere of the star is only a few centimeters thick, so it's not something that you're going to, yeah. Uh, they are charged particles, and then they spiral outward, and they spiral in this direction, creating extremely high frequency signals initially, or a visible uh, region, and that's why we see them, because they're actually, you can see the light coming off of them. And that's basically what you're going to be seeing. It's like a lighthouse, really, okay? And that's except that it's emitting in those ranges of frequencies. That's really what you're going to see. When is the light going to come back again? It's when the star makes another half turn. So that's basically what they are. Okay. Here is in the Crab Nebula, there is a there is a neutron star. That's why we think that the Crab Nebula actually formed from the uh, from uh, a supernova itself so the whole nebula is formed and uh, what we're looking at we're looking at the inside of what is inside of it namely the neutron star that was left from the explosion of the of the supernova that happened long long ago long time ago again 
If you look at them, this here with the arrow, it's pointing to a light of a star. The next one is a light of a star. And then now it disappears, okay? For the next, so note the, uh, the middle one in here. So there is a middle light, there is a middle light, and there is one next to it. And here there is a middle light, but it's dim now, the one next to it. And here it's gone completely. Here it's gone, here it's gone, and here it's appeared again. It's appeared again, and so on and so forth. So this, this light is coming on and off, and the cycle repeats, okay? It's because it's spinning. So it's bright, yet it's very, very small. The whole neutron star is only about a few kilometers in diameter. You're talking about another star, for example, in the case of the sun, the sun is 700,000 kilometers in radius. This one, the radius is only a few, a few, a few kilometers. It's like a city wide, six miles, basically from Redlands to uh, the campus or less. Yeah, from Red, less than from the Redlands to the campus. That's the whole thing. Talking about a very, very tiny object in terms of physical size. Yes, it's emitting a very high intensive uh, light that you can see. The point in here is that this is a cyclic phenomenon that repeats periodically to the point that they are actually like clocks. They are like clocks. As a matter of fact, they are more accurate than anything. The, 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 the rate at which they repeat, they could be used as universal GPS system outside of the Earth, basically to maintain time, locations, and things like that in the universe. All of this because of the, how fast they oscillate and they move, okay? Now, again, I mentioned the conservation of angular momentum. Here is the thing. Take the sun, for example. The sun, right now, the radius of the sun is 700,000 kilometers. Shrink it down to about 10 kilometers. That's a loss of how much? 70,000, because 700,000 divided by 10 is 70,000. So the radius shrinks by 70,000 less. So if you have ever watched the ballerina dance or ice skating, and when she had her arms basically open, she's spinning. But when she brings her arms to her body, in this case, her angular, her moment of inertia is smaller. She's gonna spin faster. Why is that? Because of the conservation of angular momentum. The mass of the star does not change mainly, okay? For the most part, that's not really the player. What plays a role in here is the radius. I know this is the expression for, for, for the angular momentum. There is another expression for the angular, the symbol for the angular momentum, by the way, it's, uh, it's L. It's I times the angular velocity, which is omega. So this is the moment of inertia. And I will explain that, what that is. Time is the angular velocity, the speed with which this, uh, the, uh, the velocity is swept. That's what the, the angle, how fast the angle is changing, okay? It's like, it's not distance, it's the angle. For example, right now I am going 360 degrees, but it could go 316 faster. So that is really how, how many degrees you're covering per second. So that is the angular velocity. So the ballerina, when she has her hands open like this, she's going to spin. But when she brings, and so we're gonna spin, let's say for example, she makes one turn per second. It's fast, but not as fast as when she brings her hand closer to her body, probably she will go three turns per second. She goes three times fast uh, when, when she would only do once before. Why? Because this is called the moment of inertia. An object sometimes is easier to spin, and sometimes it's harder to spin, depending on how much the mass is distributed around the center of rotation. So if the mass is at far away from the center of rotation, then it's hard to spin. If the mass is closer from the center of rotation, it's easy to spin. That's exactly what the ballerina does. When she will have her hands like this, her mass, I mean, at least part of her mass is away from her center 
of rotation from where she's spinning, okay? So in this case, she's going to spin, but not as fast as when she brings her hands closer. In that case, the mass is closer to the axis of rotation in this case, which is her the middle of her body. So in this case, she's going to have less moment of inertia, less resistance to the rotation. So she's gonna, she's gonna spin faster. So that's exactly what's going on in this case. Now, the moment of inertia in this case is proportional to the square of the radius. And this is this is this is big deal. This is big deal. Let me explain what happened to the sun. If the sun goes and becomes a uh, becomes a uh, neutron star, or it's, it's not going to be. By the way, <laughs> so we're just making a hypothesis, or at least a white dwarf the size of a neutron star. We know it's going to be a white dwarf. Okay, the size of uh, neutron star. Neutron star about 10 kilometers. Okay. So it's not the size of the earth. It's very the size of a city. Okay. Size of remnants. So uh, if the earth goes and becomes that, its angular momentum stays the same. Its moment of inertia will drop by a factor of 70,000 squared. So its angular velocity must increase by that much, by 70,000 squared. Right now, the sun does 25 days per rotation. Every 25 days, the sun goes one full cycle around the, its axis. Okay, if it were to drop to about 10 kilometers in radius, and if everything is the same, it does not lose mass, then this rotation will drop by 70,000 squared. What is it? Did I get this number? Remember, the radius of the sun is about 600, it's exactly 696,000 kilometers, about 700,000 kilometers. You're taking that radius and bringing it down to 10 kilometers. Remember, the moment of inertia is proportional to the square of the uh, radius. So its period, which is 25 days, will drop by that factor. Let me tell you how fast the sun is going to be spinning. And you will see, appreciate where this number is coming from in here, in the, uh, the one that we started with. Okay, so again, take 25,000. Uh, 25 days, I'm sorry, and divided by 70,000 squared. Let me, uh, let me first of all put a calculator in here. Calculator. And I'm going to share with you the calculator. Usually, a lot of these things will really are more appreciated, honestly, when we do the uh, numbers. Okay? Because without numbers, sometimes you can talk theory, but the theory doesn't really help much, honestly. Okay. So the sun right now does 25 days. Each day has 24 hours, and each hour has 60 minutes, and each minute has 60 seconds. So this is how many seconds? 2,160,000 seconds per rotation, per revolution. OK? That's 20, 25 days. Okay? Divide that by 70,000 squared. This is 7,000, 70,000 squared, okay? I just hit the, uh, this symbol in here to get the 70,000 squared. I'll tell you, it's gonna do a rotation that is 10 to the negative four. That means 0 0.0004 seconds, not even a fraction of a second. So it's gonna be spinning super fast. So when the theory was proposed, that this fast rotating things that you're looking at, this radio signals that are coming from far away, they are super fast. How about if they fit that model that we had before for neutron stars? And sure enough, they do. Sure enough, they do. Obviously, we took the case of the sun, 
other stars uh, come with different masses. And there is another factor I ignored in here, so probably it makes things a little bit better, namely the fact that the, the mass also changes too as a star, but because it sheds some of its mass. So the sun is not going to be, as it is right now, become a white dwarf. It's going to lose some of its mass. It's the main mass still the same, though. It's not going to change much. So that's really the, the point that is that needs to be uh, shared in here. So let me go back into my notes. So again, the model fits. I know the book gives you the angular momentum mass times velocity times radius, which is true for a point particle rotating around the point uh, distance r from uh, uh, basically uh, what it is, which is in this case the center of mass, which is the radius of the star. The velocity in this case for every point is proportional to the radius also. The velocity is equal. I use the symbol omega because that's what they use actually in uh, different books. But that, it's angular velocity. It's the radius times omega. So if I plug in the expression in here, V, so it's going to be mass times V, and V is R omega times another R. So that's where the R squared is coming from, actually. So when I say it's proportional to the square of the uh, radius, this is a known fact that the uh, that the uh, that the uh, moment of inertia, how much an object resists to the rotation, is proportional to the square, basically on uh, the distribution of masses. But that's really just to give you an idea, flavor. You're not supposed to do a lot of this math in here. But the point being in here, the analogy of the skater in, uh, in uh, on ice is a good analogy. Uh, that as she brings her hands, she moves faster. And that is why we're getting the signals that are super fast for the case of the stars. Okay. Again, the point to know in here is that the north magnetic pole and the south magnetic pole of the star or the poles of the star are not necessarily aligned with the with the uh, with the uh, the axis of rotation. Similar to what you would see in this case, in the case of a lighthouse. The lighthouse, the axis of rotation is actually perpendicular to the entire building. That's actually the building itself pointing upward. And in, the, in this case, it's spinning so that its poles would be in this direction, okay? So the spin in this case for the for the neutron star is in this direction. And the, the place where it's emitting or the polar directions are actually perpendicular to it. If it happens to be this way, that is why we see the, the, the neutron star. Now, another possibility, because the, there is no thing to prohibit you actually from having a neutron star whose axis of rotation is also where the poles are. So in this case, it's going to be bright. Because it's spinning, but you're not looking at it spinning in the projection. You're looking just at the light coming off of it. So it's going to remain bright for you as far as you're concerned, OK? So that's something that you have to keep in mind. So again, these are how the neutron stars appear first to us. So now there is something that actually shows without a, doubt, a shadow of the doubt that neutron stars exist because we can take pictures of them and actually study them too. And the model fits the, picture, the, the theory, so everything is perfect. So they do exist. So Mr. Einstein, when he discounted his, uh, his solution, or at least the solutions other people found to his equation, uh, it was based on intuition. And that intuition is that nature should not make something as beastly as this thing. And the magnetic field so near this, 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 uh, this neutron star can be super high, okay, extremely high magnetic fields, even for a regular neutron star, because neutrons themselves are magnetic. So they, they, they are magnets themselves. Okay? So they have this, their internal properties which give them magnetic properties on their own. Okay? And although they don't have a charge, and this is something that puzzled actually uh, 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 scientists in the past into how could a neutron star that has zero charge, neutron uh, particle that has zero charge, also be, has magnetic properties. And this is something that was solved a long time ago in nuclear physics. But the point being in here is that these stars have magnetic fields. Okay? So the charged particles that they are lifted, those are the ones that are accelerated and give us that light, give us that signal. Okay, That's the signal we see from them. Now, uh, most of the times, 
because of the losses of, remember, this is energy wasted. So every time there is a radiation, every second it radiates energy, it loses energy. It radiates light, it loses energy because light is energy. So ultimately, a, the, 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 the star is actually going to lose energy overall, it's going to slow down in its rotation. That's as simple as that. It's going to lose kinetic energy, which means that it's going to slow down. But sometimes in slowing down, it shrinks a little, which means it speeds up. Okay, again, remember the moment of inertia times the angular velocity, if this goes down because the mass now has shrunk a little, remember as the mass shrinks, the moment of inertia shrinks and the angular momentum stays the same no matter what. So the speed spits up a little and then slows down. So these are the so-called glitches because it condenses a little more, okay? So that is a known phenomenon. So they lose energy overall, okay? So again, in terms of structure, we really don't have, honestly, a, uh, it's just based on speculation, if you wish, based on models, numerical models, okay? So, uh, because the pressures inside are ridiculous, the temperatures inside are so, I mean, the, the, the object inside is super dense. And uh, so right now it's probably neutron superfluid or even quark fluid, okay? Something that's even weirder that you might that you can think of, namely quarks. Some sort of a quark state that is not even known to nature at all, that we cannot even make in the lab. It's impossible to do something like this in the lab because we don't have enough energies. Right now, a proton has three quarks, as I said before. Okay. You cannot extract a quark from him with all of the energies that you have, for example, in the laboratory in Switzerland, the, 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 they take protons, which are hydrogen atoms actually, hydrogen nuclei, I should say, and they smash them in the atomic smash ribs. They bring them so fast, okay? And they trying to see what's inside of them, trying to have them, two of them, so that they smash against one another, spilling what's inside of them. But that's not possible. Let me tell you why. Because the energy that is required to make such a thing happen will extract, yes, the quark from it. In doing so, it's going to actually create another empty quark on it and change changes the structure on the inside. Proton stays a proton. But now, all of a sudden, basically, what you have created is a pair of, of actually. Uh, uh, quarks, so they always come in pairs. You cannot really separate them, at least in on Earth. But in here, inside the neutron star, it's possible. So this is one of the models. Again, it's a model right now. We don't know exactly what's going on inside of them. The the density is so high, the gravity is so tremendous that the 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 the, the, the thickness, or at least the the uniformity, take any surface. Any smooth surface that you can think of. The smoothest surface that you can think of on Earth. The shiniest surface, it is rough compared to the surface of a neutron star because of the tremendous pressures that is inside of it. So that's basically what we think in terms of its structure. There is a possibility, at least for the low mass neutron stars, that maybe there is an iron still in here. Okay meaning you still have protons and neutrons. And, uh, but as you go down and down further inside, the structure changes. Again, this is based on models that we have. Now, uh, there is a, the energy that is associated with their rotations is, is sometimes, and this is probably why we call them, it's part of their uh, stages. So early on, probably when the neutron star forms, it's more like a magnet or which is ridiculous amounts of, 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 of magnetic fields that are rotating super fast. So magnetars are pulsars that are rotating super fast around their axes, but then over time they lose uh, energy so that they become normal uh, pulsating stars, pulsars, 
with the regular magnetic fields that uh, over time, that what we think, at least in terms of uh, what we know, how do they form? What is the correct model for it? It's still under investigation, basically. But they are, have so much energy that they emit actually in the X-ray region. Now, neutron stars, they could be part of a binary. They could have a supermassive star and another supermassive star. One of them goes supernova and creates a neutron star. So in this case, they still basically spin against one another. The, the, the regular star and the, the uh, neutron star, they could be uh, spin, uh, uh, basically spinning against one another. Two possibilities in here. This one also could go supernova, and now all of a sudden you have two neutron stars that are spinning one another, against one another. Okay, So the old one that formed earlier and the second one that formed later, and this opens up the possibility for them to collide, and they do. Okay. And when they do, this is what we believe again, anything higher on the periodic table than the number 44, and there are a lot, gold and all of the heavier elements in here in the periodic table, they must have, for, that they must have formed from the collision of neutron stars, not necessarily from the supernova. Supernovae create heavier elements than iron, but not all the way to the extent of, of uh, heavier elements that are past 44. So this is basically the model that we have. So we owe our existence to, in a sense, to this 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 kind of uh, this kind of uh, phenomenon where two neutron stars collide with one another, and we have observed them in the LIGO project that they do actually collide, and we have uh, neutron stars colliding. That's a possibility. There is another possibility for a neutron star actually, uh, and the collision in here is called the hypernova when the two neutron stars do collide. That one of the neutron stars starts to feed off of the uh, do we uh, uh, start to feed off of the other one and grow, okay? And starts to feed off of it and forms a, an accretion disk, I'm sorry, and that accretion disk will have even more light sh shining off of it. So neutron stars, pulsars, magnetars, they are all interesting objects. Please read this unit and go through it and make sure that if you have any questions, please let me know and uh, try to understand. I mean, unfortunately, we don't have anyone near us, at least within Earth. <laughs> Otherwise, they have super powerful magnetic fields that they could distort matter around them. And as Mr. Einstein has duly noted, these are basically too much of a uh, an odd thing that they should not really exist, yet they do, okay? We have evidence for their existence. Now, what was actually the whole thing that really pro uh, 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 propelled Mr. Einstein to reject the whole thing was actually the black holes themselves, which as I was explaining, their singularity, and singularity should really be uh, in the realm of mathematics, not in the realm of uh, reality, not in the realm of physics. That's why, yes, they are, look beautiful solution to his equations, but they, he said that they should not exist. This cannot, this is too mathematical to be even real. Yet now we know that they are real. Not only that, but we took pictures of two of them. M87 that was uh, released in, what is it, 2017, the picture of M87, which was uh, uh, about 50 million uh, light years away from us, a uh, galaxy where we took pictures, actually NASA took pictures of, of the black hole inside. And this year they released actually the pictures from our own black, uh, black holes in uh, the center of the Milky Way, which is Sagittarius A star. So they do exist. We have pictures of them, actually. And you're asking how in the world we have picture of a black hole that even light does not escape of it. We'll try to answer that question, OK? <laughs> because it's interesting. I mean, uh, we took pictures of them. Not directly, though. Not the picture of the black hole. Black holes, and I'm going to answer that point in here So <laughs> before we go any further, because I may forget. Uh, when they have matter next to them, either intergalactic uh, clouds of mm, basically gases, mainly hydrogen, or near stars, those materials start to be basically attracted to this black holes. And those black holes in the center of galaxies are supermassive. They're huge. We don't even know how they formed. Because right now, we know the normal black holes, how they form, the small black holes, how they form. But the big ones, like the ones in the center of the galaxies, like the one in our own galaxy, Sagittarius A star, that is kind of even, we don't even know how they form. But the point being in here is you have gas next to it. So it's attracted now to the black hole. It's going to start to spiral down and form an accretion disk. 
as it's going to spiral inward to the to the black hole it's going to speed up and it's going to have so much speed that's going to emit light and that's how we saw with the pictures we took if you guys have seen the movie interstellar you would see that the black hole is some sort of a some center in here and there is an accretion disk that forms around it but then it goes like this if you guys seen it okay so you're asking, what are we looking at in here? So we're looking at this ring that forms in here. Yet there is another ring that goes on the top and the bottom. So what you're looking at the top and the bottom in the same time is actually the same ring. There is no top or bottom. Everywhere you look at the black hole, it's the same thing. What you're looking at is the picture from behind it. The black holes are super massive beasts that they bend light so that the light that is behind it looks on top in here and the bottom in the same time. So if you look at the picture from the movie Interstellar where they were near that big supermassive black hole. By the way, that movie was done before we actually took a picture of a real uh, black hole. And it was done by with the help of a physicist and whose models, basically, the models of the physicists, astrophysicists, I should say, was that the black holes, if they do exist, they should look like that. And indeed, the picture that was released in 2017 after the movie was released, and also after uh, uh, the one that was released recently in here for uh, our own uh, black hole, they, they, they match the picture that was released. So they do exist, their singularity, yes, and the math for them is ridiculously difficult to even comprehend at this point, but we are trying to understand. Okay, you remember that for the case of uh, the Earth, for example, okay? Here is the Earth, okay? You throw an, uh, a rock out of it, trying to get it to escape. So you give it kinetic energy. This is what the kinetic energy is. One half of mass times velocity squared. So this is the kinetic energy that you give it to the rock trying to escape the pull of the earth or a rocket, whatever you can think of, or a Superman or whatever. So this is his kinetic energy. In order for him to escape, he has to have enough kinetic energy to overcome the force of gravity to, to the earth. And the force of gravity to the earth is G times the mass of the object, which is the same mass in here, times the mass of the earth divided by the radius, this is the energy. So the kinetic energy must be equal to the gravitational energy. That's in a nutshell for you trying to escape Earth. Since we don't care about Superman's mass or the rock or the rocket, whatever object you're going to do, the mass cancels as a matter of fact. So if you work out this expression, that means G times the mass of the Earth divided by the radius of the Earth must be equal to one half times velocity squared. This is the so-called escape velocity. If you multiply both by two and you divide by, uh, and multiply two sides by two, you cancel the two on this side and you will have a two in here and you take a square root. So the escape velocity is exactly as given by that expression, two G times M divided by R. This is the escape velocity. On earth, it's 11.2 kilometers per second. So if NASA wants to uh, send a rocket out of space, they have to give it that velocity in order to escape. If you throw a rock in the air with that much speed, it's going to escape the pull of the Earth and it's going to go far away, basically, because it will have enough kinetic energy to overcome the gravitational pull due to the Earth. That's basically what the escape velocity means. If you have enough velocity that you escape. Here is the kicker, though. What happened if this escape velocity is the speed of light? Well, if Nothing can go faster than the speed of light, basically. So if this is the speed of light, so I'm going to make C, this speed to be C squared now, is equal to 2G times the mass of the object divided by the radius. This radius now is a radius that has a name. It's called the RS, Schwarzschild radius. He's the one who calculated this one when he was actually uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, fighting in World War I. Okay? It was actually in the, <laughs> the, the, the war when he did that. So if I plug in this number and move it to the other side, that gives me this radius beyond which not even light can escape. So if you take Earth, the mass of the Earth times G times 2 divided by the speed of light, so all of these are known. 
And if you plug in, you will find the size of the Earth is going to be very small, by the way. So it's not possible to make a black hole out of the Earth unless you have tremendous forces somehow that you can shrink it to that size. Then it's going to be a black hole. Obviously, you don't have enough gravity in the sun to put it to that close to make it into a black hole. But supermassive stars, yes, they do. When they shrink, and they can go into a block because they have enough gravity to pull them together to this point to have radii of this size. Once they reach this point, then they continue to shrink further and further to the point where basically, so they have a lot of mass inside, and that mass changes nature. It's not something that you can, even the physics of it right now, we don't understand. So in this case, beyond this radius, there is a breakdown we don't understand. Nobody knows. Because as I was saying, it's a singularity. It's like dividing zero by zero. We don't understand that. We don't know how it works. We know, though, a few things. First of all, uh, objects do not behave as they do normally in our universe. In other words, things do not happen where, they happen when. There is a distinction in here. Time, space converts to time. Thing, things instead of moving in space, they will be basically uh, happening in time. And time slows down by a huge factor to a standstill. And all kinds of phenomena starts to basically appear at that point. Okay. So let me first of all continue with this discussion. We'll see that. First of all, at that point, this 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 whole approach that I did is basic. Uh, based on classical mechanics. Classical mechanics really doesn't understand uh, black holes and even modern physics, namely <laughs> the theory of Einstein does not really understand it. But the whole idea that led to its existence is actually based on this analogy that we have in here. So you have space and you have time. Things are happening in space-time and space-time in the theory of Einstein become one. And the fabric of space-time is basically what everything is happening, okay? That's why I was asking, saying in there earlier that things do not happen where, but they start happening when, that's all. So the, 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 only in this axis, not in this axis, not, not in this, the, the, the space, uh, the space uh, coordinates. The point being in here is this is the fabric where everything is happening. So a supermassive object like the Earth, for example, or even that of the sun, what they do, they bend this fabric. So according to them, there is no force of gravity that we saw earlier. So this does not exist. So this is a force of gravity. I know I wrote the potential earlier for the, for the uh, energy, uh, gravitational potential energy divided just by R and the, and the forces divided by R squared. So for this case, uh, this doesn't make sense. No forces. It's only geometry. So basically, supermassive object bends space-time. The more massive, the for, far more dent you're going to have, like in this case. And an object surrounding it really is not feeling the force of gravity because it does. there is no such a thing as force. All they're trying to do is going around a space-time continuum moving around it. And as they do, if they have enough velocity, they will stay in orbit. Like the Earth, for example, is moving around the sun because not because there is a force, but rather because of the fact that it's trying to avoid falling toward the sun. That's all in this distortion of space-time continuum. But the black hole is so such a massive object that it actually creates a, a dot in the space-time continuum. It creates a deformation in it, okay? And this deformation will go forever and ever and ever. Please do not think, and I know it looks like it's a flat, that is actually three-dimensional. Remember, I have to go, it can go forward and backward, I can go left and right, and I can go up and down. 
So the surface that you're looking at it is actually in all of those directions in addition to forward and backward in time, okay? Moving uh, forward in time and moving backward in time. So it's really a representation, not an accurate one. You cannot really represent it this way. But the point being in here, this is what the singularity is. That's what the black hole is. So black hole has a radius. And that is the RS radius that I was talking about in here earlier. And this radius beyond which not even light can escape. I know I gave the expression for it. it's two times G times the mass of the object itself divided by the speed of light squared. Now, if you throw in more materials on it, the mass will increase and the radius will increase further. So that's how we think black holes increase in size. The more they feed, the stronger they become and the further they become and bigger in size. So that's probably how supermassive black holes. That's one possibility. The other possibility is the merger of two black holes. When they merge, they make even a bigger black hole. And the picture that I'm drawing it, I'm drawing it in 2D, but it's actually a little bit better to look at it in terms of, uh, of, uh, of uh, how uh, uh, that movie represented it, or at least the pictures that were released more recently about the two black holes that we, were took, we took pictures of them, nam namely M87 and that of uh, um, uh, Sagittarius uh, star. Okay? That's how they represented a star. Okay. That's for our own black hole, the, uh, uh, our own galaxy's black hole. Now, there is something that I'm going to mention here. I know it's not in here, but it's actually part of a lot of uh, sci-fi uh, discussions, but it's actually uh, uh, has to do with astrophysics, and this is a wormhole. Wormholes are slightly different than black holes in a sense they really don't uh, go into complete singularity. They are powerful, they require a lot of energy, but they need to be open from both sides, okay? So, and that's what they are used actually in, 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 in sci-fi movies a lot. So wormhole is slightly less, uh, 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 less odd, if you wish, than a worm or a black hole. There is no enough energy on Earth right now that we know of, not enough energy in the solar system at all to make a wormhole, let alone black hole, okay? And wormholes, W-O-R-M, by the way, not W-A-R-M. It's not like warm, like hot. Okay? It's a worm like the one that keeps on um, in, in, the, the, in, the, in the garden. Okay, So those, they will bend space-time from one end, and hopefully you can bend them from the other end so that you can travel a month of distances in space by crossing through time and ending up somewhere else, okay? So that, that's basically the idea behind them. And this idea is not sci-fi. This is based on, on, uh, on, uh, on uh, basically the studies of uh, coming from the general theory of relativity. I just mentioned that in here because of this picture. But sometimes when you're reading about that and you're looking at it and you see a wormhole, the wormhole is similar to the black hole except it has a little bit less energy to it. And it's actually open from both ends. And it's usually if, uh, uh, it's open to different spaces. So basically, again, to go back to the analogy with the movie Interstellar, they had actually a wormhole that they somehow built into a near uh, what is that uh, near Neptune, I think. Yeah, near Neptune, and ended up in a different galaxy from the other end. So that's basically the idea of the sci-fi movie. But the point being, in here they are based on real science. Okay, so they are not really completely sci-fi in the sense. But at this point, we don't have enough energy on Earth. We don't have enough energy on the solar system to even think about it or the technology to do that without actually destroying the whole solar system in the process. Okay. Another point in here, since we're talking about a little bit of relativity in here and discussion of these things, is uh, uh, the uh, Lorentz factor. This gamma G in here that you see in here, it's called the Lorentz factor. The symbol for Lorentz factor is gamma, usually the Greek letter gamma, the lowercase Greek letter gamma. I know that there is another gamma that looks like this. That, yeah, but this is, is this gamma? Yeah, and this is the other gamma. 
So this is the gamma. But in here you have due to the gravity, so you have the index G in it. This one is inversely proportional to the difference between the ratio of the distance from the black hole to the uh, 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 short five radius, RS. What happened what that means in here? Time will slow by this factor, by gamma, depending on how far you are from the black hole, okay? If you are far away from it, let's say, for example, two different, uh, two radii, so it's gonna first, uh, going to sp uh, sp uh, reduce by factor of one over one half, okay? If you are twice from the black hole, radius from the black hole here. So if this distance, let's say, for example, for the case of argument, let's say, for example, this is 10 kilometers and you are 20 kilometers away from it. Then in this case, one or 10 over 20 is just one half. So the radius of that is going to be the radius of one over square root of two, because one half, not square root of two, one half. So, uh, so it's gonna be the radius of two at the end when you take this radius in. And the radius of two is just 1.41. So in other words, a second will appear 1.4 seconds. It doesn't sound much, and it, it is for sure, you are right, because you are twice as far from the, the radius as, as you are. But if you are closer, let's say, for example, you are actually at 11 kilometers. Now you have to be careful. If you are at 11 kilometers, it's going to be a radius of square one minus. The distance now is actually, let's say, for example, it's 10, and the distance now is actually a... Uh, 11 over 10, what is that, okay? 11, I'm trying to come up with them. Yeah, yeah, the, the 10 over 11, that's the number, okay? So I'm just throwing numbers in here, I know that you guys. So the, 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 the radius in this case will be a, a square root of, what is it? 11 minus 10, that's one. So square root of 11, that's basically what it is, okay? Square root of 11 is roughly three and a half. So in this case, one second is three and a half seconds. If you get very, very close from it to a point that you are just on top of it, I'm just going to throw in a very big number in here, you're going to be at the radius, let's say for example, a millimeter away, okay, for example, okay? Millimeter away would be the radius of 10,000, square root of 10,000. That is going to be a second will last 100 seconds, and so on and so forth. The, so the point being in here, as you're getting closer and closer and closer and closer from the black hole, time starts to slow, 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 slow. Initially, it doesn't show much, but afterwards, it's going to slow to a crawl. So for somebody watching you uh, going into the black hole, they would think that, hey, you're frozen in time. You're not moving. But for you, everything looks normal. Everything looks normal. That is one factor. The other thing also that is actually depicted in this picture, your link starts to, sh to, 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 to grow by this factor also, and your width starts to shrink. This is called spag spag spaghettification, like spaghetti. <laughs> you take a person and you pull them apart, basically, okay? You pull them apart. That's basically what this is called the sp spaghettification. Make them into spaghetti. Okay. <laughs> so that's basically what the, the, the phenomenon of the black hole is. Now you have to be careful in here. This is for a small black hole. For a very large black hole, because you already start with a huge one, you wouldn't even notice this, this difference. So for you, you're going just through it, but then different things start to happen in that. Okay. Enough talk about these things. This is not sci-fi, by the way. This is based on science. I know when you go and see it in sci-fi, sometimes they exaggerate things, but this is based on the uh, what we know from uh, relativity and what we understand based on that. Okay. So again, as I said before, we took pictures already of at least two black holes. So what we're looking at again in the the the, the pictures is actually the accretion disk that forms around it from the falling gas. Normal black hole, you cannot see it. You can see it in two different ways, if you wish, okay? Either through the, uh, the, the accretion disk that form around it when it's feeding, or you can see it when it passes in front of a star or another object. 
even far away, then what happened in this case, light bends around it due to something called gravitational uh, uh, lensing, okay? So that's basically, it's like a lens, it magnifies, it changes the, bends the radiation that is coming from it. So then you can, you can see the black hole, otherwise you cannot see it, which, which begs another question in here, Black holes must have formed early on in the universe, and those have become so tiny now, even this effect is cannot be seen. So there is the idea when you read about it and you talk about when you read about the primordial black holes, they must exist, but we cannot really detect them. So one of them probably could be roaming not too far from us until and, and you cannot see it, you cannot do anything about it. Okay. That's actually one of the ideas that is being floated nowadays about Planet Nine. So Planet Nine may be just a primordial black hole, which is too small to be seen, and you cannot see it anyway, unless it's feeding or something. So Planet Nine, hypothetically, that is serving the path of the, the, the uh, TNOs, the trans-Neptunian objects, that could be actually a primordial uh, black hole. So that's a possibility that is being explored nowadays. Again, uh, if it is part of a binary, you can see also the dimming of the companion. That is actually also another way of detecting the black uh, black hole. Finally, how black holes dies because uh, die how black holes die is another uh, thing that was extensively studied. And one of the people who spent a lot of time in, uh, understanding it was Mr. Uh, Hawking and the radiation that is uh, 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 basically later on basically studied and modeled later on on computers and also using a different technique, actually using uh, sound waves actually that uh, mimic the, uh, the black hole formations. So uh, uh, hot radiations now we think is real too. It's not just based on theory. So here is a process. You have a black hole in here and this is its radius. This is its event horizon where nothing, basically the minute you pass this, this radius, you're gone, okay? you're going to be into the black holes. Uh, there is uh, energy everywhere, and that is energy of the vacuum. This is a known fact actually from elementary particle physics. So in here, next to a black hole, and everywhere else, as a matter of fact, usually pairs, for example, of an electron and a positron form. Immediately, they cancel one another. So they come into existence, and they go out of existence immediately in a blink of a second. This is a known phenomenon, OK? It's so not just for the electron positron, but for any other particle. We'll take the example of the electron and positron. So this is an electron. This is an electron with positive charge. So initially they did not exist. But for a brief moment in vacuum, they exist. And before you take notice, they disappear again. They cancel one another and they disappear again. So it's the, the example that is given by the people from elementary particle physics is similar to you or me, for example. I don't have, for example, a million dollars, okay? So what I can do in here in this case is I could go to the bank, take a million dollars from the bank and put it back in the bank before the bank notices. That's basically the analogy that is given. So if you do this operation, let's say, for example, in one-tenth of a second, for example, tenth of a second, not one second, a tenth of a second. So before they even notice, you took the money and you put it back. Obviously, when they go account for their money, they don't see any changes. 10 million was gone, 10 million came back before they even notice, before they even pay attention to it. So that's the analogy that is given from uh, elementary particle physics. But here is the trick. So this thing happens all the time, particles and antiparticles. This is, by the way, called an antiparticle. And this is a regular particle. Electron is a regular particle that we see in nature on a regular basis. So a pair of a particle and antiparticle will form in here. It doesn't matter which one end up inside, the other one could end up outside, near the event horizon. The one that goes in is gone forever. It's going, not going to come out completely. The one that is on this side in here will carry with it energy that did not exist from before. Where did that energy come from? It must come from the black hole itself. 
So this is what the, uh, uh, Hawking radiation is. Obviously, if it's a positron, it's going to meet another electron and it's going to cancel each other. If it is a regular electron, it's going to fly, no problem. As I was saying in here, a pair forms, either a positron go in, in which case an electron flow out, or an electron go in and an antiparticle will come out. The antiparticle will meet a particle somewhere and will cancel it, will annihilate, produce energy. So you're asking, where is that energy coming from? And you're absolutely right. The energy of the universe is conserved since there is an addition of energy in here from in the universe, the rest of the universe, that must come from the black hole. So the black holes overall due to this radiation that Mr. Hawking basically came up with, it will lose energy overall. And that is how they die. So due to the Hawking radiation, a black hole over incredible amount of time will ultimately also lose all of its energy and fade away and fade away okay i think we spent a little bit of time on these two units okay we give them a fair shake we still have four more units so i'm going to see exactly how we're going to handle them either i'm going to do them in two recordings or at least one recording and i'm going to post them for you guys Please make sure you go through the reviews, make sure you go through all of the things that needs to be done so that you guys are ready for the, uh, for the exams. Any question? If not, okay, thank you very much. I'm going to stop the recording and I'm gonna see you uh, at least, I'll communicate with you guys, how is that? <laughs> thank you, thank you for having you in this class. We still have some more material, so don't go away, okay? We still have a lot of stuff, okay? Thank you.